Well, Howdy Bridgeway, it's great to see you here today. I want to jump right into things this morning. So if you've got a Bible, I'd love for you to turn to James chapter 3. Uh, I'd love for you to see these words for yourself in the Bible. So if you've got a Bible uh, or your favorite Bible app, I would love you, for you to find your way there. James is towards the end of the Bible. So if you get to the book of Revelation, just go back to the left and you'll find James and we'll be in chapter 3. We've been studying this great little book and it's been my hope that you would begin to understand how to have what James is talking about, how to have this faith that works. The world might be falling apart, but your faith doesn't have to. And uh, I want to welcome those of you who are here, welcome those of you who are joining us at Church Online as well. And it's good to be together here with you this week on this beautiful snowy morning. Wasn't that just beautiful? Like, like yesterday, so beautiful, right? I mean, more snow, and I know, I know, some of you, and there's kids in the room, right? Like, next week is spring break, and spring break, of course, is that annual time of year where half of the state of Michigan goes down south, right? And and can you blame them? I checked. There is no snow in Florida. Can you imagine that? There's none whatsoever. But even better than that, when uh, we get back, we'll be able to celebrate Easter together. And uh, I just want to add one thing to what Justin was saying, which is we're praying for you. Uh, we're praying for Easter to, be, to really be this experience where, where Jesus is the greatest story that's ever been told. And so we're praying for you. We're praying for uh, you as you think about who needs to come and to hear that message uh, here at Bridgeway this Easter. We're hoping that everything we do around the pancake breakfast and the egg hunt can all just be a service to our community around here. So we're looking forward to that. But today it's James, and to get you thinking about what James is going to challenge us with this morning, I want to ask you a question. I want you maybe just for a moment just to kind of imagine you had like that, that one wish. You know what I mean? Like you had like, I don't know, that genie in a bottle sort of moment, and you could you can have anything you wish for. Let me just ask you this. What would you wish for? You got one wish. What would you wish for? And maybe some of you are like, oh, pastor, you know, it'd be, it'd be that big pile of cash, right? Like, and I'd be the first to tell you, you know, money doesn't bring you happiness. And you'd be like, yeah, I know. I just want to try it just for a little bit. I, I know it won't work, but let me, just, let me just try it for a little bit. And I don't know, maybe that's your wish. Maybe your wish isn't that. Maybe it's, it's you want to get into your dream home. And have you seen real estate these days? It's kind of like you need a lot of this to buy one of these, right? So you're like, oh, come on, just one wish would be that they accept my offer, right? And I get into the home that I want. Maybe, maybe your wish would be for a dream vacation. Maybe your wish would be uh, for a really incredible, amazing car. In fact, uh, this car is inspiring me this week because I was having uh, lunch with our worship leader, Charles, and came out of the restaurant, and Charles has an eye for really nice cars, and he notices two cars, and he points over at them. One of them is my car, my 2003 Honda Element. It's a classic. Some people call it Toasty. It's a small, compact car, but next to my Toasty is this incredible McLaren. And I'll just tell you, like, I did not know that after lunch, I could covet so much. Like, I'm just filled with this, like, oh, that car is just amazing. Turns out my son just said, oh, yeah, I've seen it all around Rockford. So there's a chance someone within the sound of my voice could be offering to give me a ride in it this week. Just saying, not being prophetic, just saying, just saying, right? Maybe that's your wish. What would you wish for? And while that's kind of roaming through your mind, what I want to tell you is, James is going to do what he's been doing almost every week in this series, is he's going to right-size our priorities. And by that I mean he's going to punch us in the mouth again, because James has been very clear. He's kind of hammering away and chiseling away at what we think we need. He does something really uh, interesting. I've been reading through the book of James. James is a master at kind of this compare and contrast. He'll kind of set off like two sides sort of against each other. So last week we looked at at what we think we need. We, th we think we need to have favorites. We think we need to play favorites, right? And James was really clear last week, like, don't make favorites because what you'll end up doing is you'll, you'll elevate one and you'll subjugate another. You'll have one group of people that are your favorites and then another group of people that just annoy the life out of you. And again, he's going to tell us not to make this sort of these sort of goal line stands. And in fact, what James would tell you, if there is one thing that you could wish for, it's this. I'm going to tell you right at the very beginning. It's 
to have godly wisdom. And I've been really looking forward to preaching this message in this series because I think this idea of how to have godly wisdom is so needed in our day today. I look at the world and I just think, man, if we, if we as Christians could just kind of just soak in and bring down this wisdom that God provides, it'd be a totally different world that we live in. Wisdom is what we're after. And the irony, when you look at the life of James, is he didn't seem to have a lot of wisdom throughout most of his life. In fact, just as a quick recap, if you're new with us, uh, James is kind of an important person because he grew up in a kind of important home. His parents were Mary and Joseph, and that meant that his big brother was none other than Jesus. But like most of Jesus' family, they did not believe that Jesus was the one true son of God. They could not believe that Jesus was the Messiah. They watched Jesus teach, and they just sort of scoffed at him. They watched him do miracles and, and teach with wisdom, and they could not believe that he was from God. And it wasn't until much later, in fact, it wasn't until Easter, it wasn't until the resurrection, when he saw Jesus conquer all death, the devil, and the grave, that James finally came into this realization that he was wrong. And now he's writing much later in life. He's, he's older, he's wiser. I don't know, maybe like we would say things like, like James has experienced some things in life. You ever go through some stuff and you come through the other side of that and you're, you're just kind of like more able to handle things? That's James. He's wiser, he's sort of, sort of like a sage and things don't freak him out the way they used to. And he's trying to kind of like, come alongside of this church and this group of people and just really remind them that what you're after, what you should wish for more than anything else in life is this godly wisdom. And James is going to tell us how. Hopefully you found your way to James chapter 3. We're going to start in verse 13. James writes, Who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show it by their good life, by deeds done, in the humility that comes from wisdom. Now, let me just pause right here for a moment because James asks a really important question. I, I think it's a question for us here today. Uh, who is wise among you? Let me ask that a little differently. What's your source of wisdom? Who, who do you go to for advice and counsel? Who's kind of the wise people that you've placed around your life? I don't know. I, I look around and I I see who maybe has the loudest voices, and I think sometimes they're the ones that we go to for wisdom. So maybe it's a celebrity or a sports figure. Maybe it's an influencer. I don't know. Maybe it's, maybe it's some YouTuber, right? And you go on YouTube, and you, you think, man, they've, they've figured it out, right? I mean, they're living in a van. They're touring all over the, the country, and they've somehow figured out how to, like, I got to go to work every day, and they're, they're living off ad revenue. Every time I watch them, they make money. It's like they seem pretty wise, right? And, and who is that? Who is that for you that you go to? I, I was kind of doing some things. I did what maybe many of you would do is I, I went to Google, and, and I just kind of typed in, who's the wisest person alive today send, right? And Google didn't give me what I was looking for. In fact, I said wisdom, and Google came back with kind of this listing of people who are just off the charts of intelligence. I, I wanted wisdom, and, and Google gave me IQ. And I didn't know this. Do you know that someone with an IQ above uh, 160 is considered a genius? I, I went to public schools. So I didn't know this. But uh, 160 and above is genius level. And so it starts giving me all these names, people like, like Paul Allen. I don't know if you know who Paul Allen is. You probably know his sidekick, Bill Gates, together they started Microsoft. But Paul Allen was sort of the genius. I mean, Bill Gates is no slouch, but, but Paul Allen off the charts. Uh, give me another name, and this person I did recognize, uh, his name is Stephen Hawking, and he's known throughout religious circles because he's anti-religion. In fact, he's a, a devout atheist. He passed away, and in his life, he never really found, uh, he never really found faith. And so I've always kind of had this strange uh, like wondering, like, like, how can you be so smart as Stephen Hawking and, and, and never cross this bridge of, of the faith journey? And then further down the list caught my eye, a guy by the name of Warren Buffett. If you don't know who Warren Buffett is, he's kind of a hero of mine. He's, uh, he's kind of like a genius of investing, kind of a wizard of Wall Street. And so, although uh, Warren Buffett's IQ was actually just below the cutoff, only 150, right? 
Uh, but Warren Buffett's worth like $102 billion. So I think he kind of makes up for it, and that got him on the list. But it's so fascinating. It led me down this, this wormhole of just understanding human capacity. And, I mean, did you know that there's so much more that we're made of than, than just a number known as our IQ? In fact, when you study human capacity, if you study kind of the quotient of life, there's all sorts of things that make up how unique we are. And so there's IQ, but have you also noticed that some people are really good with emotions? And they would be really high in what we call EQ, emotional quotient. And they get their emotions, they help understand your emotions, they make great counselors and people to, to guide and help others. And, and that's another gift. There's other people, though, that are off the charts in what they call a spatial quotient. They can see a space and they can imagine it a certain way and they make really good architects, by the way. And there's all these different categories. There's musical geniuses and, and people who, oh, this was interesting. There was one category known as a kinesthetic quotient. And it's, it's like the athlete that really knows how their body works. And it compared it to a, a gymnast who can, only a gymnast could like launch themselves into the air and in the air spin and twist and then stick the landing. That takes an incredible capacity of of human ability. And there's all these things that make up who we are, and yet none of them really give us the answer of who is wise among you. James is going to tell you how to get this wisdom, and he's going to do it by comparing kind of this life. He's saying this life is really about the deeds that you do, kind of the way in which you live a good life, you want a good life. It comes through these deeds that are done in humility. And he's going to describe for us kind of Two types of wisdom, two ways in which you can seek wisdom in life. I want to see if you can kind of pick up on this comparing and contrasting of the two kinds of wisdom. Picking back up in verse 14. James says, but if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. But where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder in every evil practice. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is, first of all, pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy, and good fruit, impartial, and sincere. Peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. So, okay, did you catch them? There's two sources of wisdom. And it's really directional. It really matters if you can kind of follow James' thinking. He says there's kind of a, way, a place you go to for wisdom. And he describes two different places. He says the first source is earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. How many of you are like, that's it. That's why I came to church today. Sign me up for that. I want to live a carnal, disorderly life. I want to get my face on TMZ, right? Like total dumb and dumber. I mean, that's the kind of wisdom I want. I hope not. I don't see any hands going in the air, right? He says that's one source of wisdom, but then there's another source. He says there's this other kind of wisdom that has all these incredible characteristics. It's pure and peace-loving and considerate and submissive and merciful and good and impartial, meaning non-judgmental. All the things we've been talking about in this series. And, And maybe who would say, oh, sign me up. That's the one I want. And where does that come from? He says, that comes from heaven. This is a a source of wisdom that we can draw into our lives. And I was thinking about how this must have been kind of an eye-opener for James. Because here he is, the little brother of Jesus. And he must have, at some point, kind of been spying on Jesus, right? I mean, even as a kid, he probably was peeking in on Jesus. And I have to imagine that at some point, James witnessed Jesus pray, right? I mean, not only as an adult, but maybe even as a youth or a child. And, and he must have wondered, like, where are you going? Where are you going with all these prayers? And, of course, Jesus unlocks for us really the direction of where, where our prayer, where our conversations are to go. Because even his disciples would notice that later in their life. In fact, the disciples actually come to Jesus and they say, Jesus, teach us how to pray, We see how you pray, and Jesus, when you pray, it seems like things really happen. I mean, people are healed, storms are calmed, you know. It's like when we pray, hardly anything happens. It's like we're JV and and you're varsity, Jesus, so teach us how to pray. And if you think about that moment, it's in Matthew chapter 6, the disciples come and they eagerly want to learn how to pray. And I I grew up in a church where uh, 
I grew up in a church tradition where we would say the Lord's Prayer uh, like every week and then every day at school as well. And I took catechism and, and I remember learning the Lord's Prayer, but I never made this connection that I think James is making. If you think about the Lord's Prayer, right? I mean, it starts out, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Many of you know that prayer. Many of you uh, have kind of a, a closeness to that prayer. And, and when you think of that prayer, think about it. How many times does Jesus say the word heaven? Our Father in where? Heaven. Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Where is God's kingdom? It's up in heaven. And your will be done on earth as it is in where? Heaven. It's like James is making this incredible connection about the same source of wisdom is the same source of our eternity and our Father in heaven. And we have this opportunity then to lean into this heaven here on earth. I think a lot of times, I think Christians have this view of heaven as just sort of a, a destination, right? In fact, especially when the world looks really, really, you know, bad, <laughs> we think, oh, I can't wait to to evacuate this earth and go off to heaven. And we kind of live with this, like, well, this earth is tarnished, and I want to go to heaven. And in fact, James is saying is there's a different way to live. We're to live in a way in which this place starts to resemble the place of heaven. And I know it doesn't feel like that all the time. In fact, uh, even yesterday I was thinking about this because I was thinking about my, my actions, and I was out for a run, and it was, you know, yesterday like today, it was cold and windy and snowy, and I wasn't really enjoying this run very much, especially because the road was very slippery, and I was trying to maintain, like, not falling in the ditch, and at the same time, not getting plastered by vehicles driving by me, and, and I was coming up this hill, and this truck came over this hill, and, you know, it's kind of like I'm running into traffic, and, and, you know, again, if you don't know this, like, you should always, like, get over a little bit, like, don't run over runners, please, I mean, it's just kind of my plea from the stage this morning, and, and this truck didn't get over, like, I about went to heaven yesterday because the mirror was really, really close to my head. I was kind of like the matrix, like dodging this mirror as it went by. And I was angry. And I saw this truck because I kind of did one of these, like, what was that? Like, you about sent me to heaven. I mean, seriously. And, and this truck decided to come back. And so we had this conversation. And I'll tell you, there's two types of anger, right? There's, there's a righteous sort of anger and an unrighteous sort of anger. And I was borderline. Like, I... I I, I walked away from that conversation, and a couple miles later, I'd finally slowed down and cooled down, and, and I thought to myself, is that really, I can do better, right? I mean, I, I can do more about bringing heaven here, even, even to earth, even on my little Saturday morning run. And I think that's what James is getting at in this text. In fact, I'll try to illustrate this for you. There's these two kinds of wisdom. And James is saying you can either live with an earthly sort of wisdom or a heavenly wisdom. You can either live unspiritually or godly. You can either live with a demonic sort of wisdom or a divine wisdom. I'll say it another way. You can either bring heaven down or by your actions, you can bring hell up. And some of you are like, well, wait a minute, Pastor, I... I was just kind of going for the good person rule, like I just want to be a good person, and I want to put food on the table, and I want to pay off my kids' braces someday, and maybe go on a vacation, and whoa, 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 what about, you're talking about heaven down or hell up, and what I'm saying to you is this is why I wanted you to read this in the text, is these are the two sources of wisdom, and we have to choose in every moment, in every situation, whether we're going to bring heaven down or bring hell up, and that choice is often well within our means. In fact, I think what James is trying to do is give some really clear warning signs to the church. He loves these people. They're scared. They're scattered even, and he's trying to show them there's, there's some warning signs. So go back to verse 14, and he talks about this earthly, unspiritual, demonic kind of wisdom, and he says it really starts with this. If you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, that's where it's going to lead. And, and I know the tendency is when we read sort of these sort of things about our heart, we want to just quickly pass through them. But I actually want to ask you to pause for a moment and just make an honest assessment of your own condition right now. And be a little suspicious of yourself this morning. And let me just ask you, is there any bitter envy or selfish 
ambition in you. Let me kind of break these, these down. The word bitter is very interesting because I think sometimes we think bitterness is just something we hold on to, but, but bitterness is actually, it's a way in which we act out. In fact, we, we're bitter because we, we pick on others, and oftentimes it comes from a place of not liking ourselves very much, and so we, we pick at other people. In fact, it's interesting. The word bitter in the Greek language is the word pikron, which actually means to, to pick at, to pick apart another person. So just give yourself a little self-assessment. Are you this morning struggling, dealing with any bitterness? And bitterness tends to travel with its really good friend and partner in crime, envy. And envy is, of course, that thing we never want to admit, which is we wish we had someone else's life. Or, or at least maybe part of their life, right? The part that we, we observe and see. And, and so we envy them. And we want what they have. And maybe we even, you know, kind of don't say it, but we just sort of in our hearts, we feel it, right? I mean, oh, great, you got a new car. I've still got a clunker, right? Or, oh, your deal went through on the house. I got another medical bill. Oh, you lost 10 pounds? I found them, right? You know, like, and you just kind of get envious of other people. Make an assessment this morning. How you doing in the area of envy? Also, selfish ambition. Now, I'll just pause here for a moment because ambition, is ambition in and of itself a bad thing? No. In fact, to be ambitious, to have a a desire and to pursue it, things that are God-honoring is really, really good. The problem is, is when that desire kind of comes back in on itself. Great reformer uh, Martin Luther would say that the the human heart left on its own is is kind of got this nature of being curved in, in curvitas is the Latin language, that your heart on on its own, it kind of just, it curves in on itself and it serves itself. And he said, that's where we get in trouble. If your passion, if your desire, if your ambition is to serve others and to serve the world and to help people in need, then that would be a, a proper ambition. But it gets curved in on itself so easily. We're ambitious for ourselves. In fact, I was doing a little study uh, just on the character of Moses, looking at Moses in the Old Testament. And Moses had a lot of ambition. If you think about him, he, he wanted justice, and he saw his fellow man being mistreated, and so he steps into that moment, but he goes too far, right? And he, he kills that Egyptian servant. And then later in life, he's actually leading God's people and He gets so frustrated with God's people, and he's trying to get them into the promised land. That's his ambition. That's his goal. And he takes his staff, and he strikes the rock. And, of course, God told him not to strike the rock. God told him just to speak to the rock. And that one action of striking the rock kept him from seeing the promised land. See, it's it's an ambition, but it turns self-serving. I must justify my actions. Selfish ambition, envy, bitterness. And these are the sort of things that keep us from really understanding this wisdom, and the change that needs to happen in our heart. In fact, I love how the Old Testament kind of refers to the need that we have to have kind of a, a, a total makeover of our lives, and especially our heart. In fact, I love these words from Ezekiel chapter 36. Uh, this is God speaking through the prophet Ezekiel, and he says, I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you, and I will remove the heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. Think about that for a moment. If If you have a life apart from God, your heart, it's not even a fixer-upper. I mean, it needs to be. It's not even like you can just put a fresh coat of paint on that thing. It's got to be completely gutted because it's stone. It's it's hardness apart from God and people. And what you need is you need this new heart, this heart of flesh. And that can be a little scary to think, I've got to go to God, and God's got to do this this complete heart surgery. He's got to change me from the inside out. But then and only then, then, then you can get this wisdom from heaven, this wisdom that is pure and peace-loving and considerate and submissive and merciful. And the beautiful thing is James knows it, not because it's words in a book. It's James knows this because this is what he observed in the life of those who followed Jesus. He saw that in people who followed Jesus for even just three years of their life, they started out and they were the ones that were selfish, and they were the ones that were self-protective, and, and they were power-hungry and earthly. And even uh, two of the women that we know, Martha being one of them, was at one point demonic. And James watched Jesus deliver these disciples, I mean, all but Judas, right, from these incredible selfish needs into having this opportunity to live from godly wisdom. 
So how do we do that? I wanted to be very practical this morning and just give you two thoughts, two ways in which you and I can grow in our godly wisdom. And the first thing I would say very clearly from the text is what James is telling us is you must be born again. And I, I was very careful with how I chose that language. In fact, by that I mean I, I changed it, and I changed it back, and I changed it again, and I changed it back to this, that you must be born again. God was so crystal clear with me that this is the language of how we receive. As wisdom comes down, uh, we, it starts with us receiving this grace that only comes down from heaven. And so you must be born again. I know that language, born again, can kind of get sort of, it can kind of trip us up today because it looks more like a label, right? I mean, it looks more like people say about Christians, right? Oh, those born-again Christians, and they usually don't meet it in a really nice way. And what I would say is we're not born-again Christians, but you must be born again to live a life in Christ. There's a great conversation that Jesus has in John chapter 3. You know it. It's the famous conversation where John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. But before that, he has, he's having this conversation with a religious leader, someone who should know where grace and wisdom all come from, and, and yet he doesn't get it, and Jesus has to tell him, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. And so I, I want to just talk for a moment to maybe two people, two groups of people that are here this morning. You might be here this morning, and and you might be the person that's never experienced what it means to be born again. And, and this morning, you're kind of leaning in. You're leaning in because you, you see the wisdom of the world, and it's not working for you. And, and I would just simply say to you, if you're leaning into God, that God will meet you, and he'll, he'll bring you the rest of the way. But you must give your life to him, and you must experience this transformation of your heart being made new, getting that heart of, of stone out and that heart of flesh in. And God will do that. God will make you brand new. And I hope you do that. In fact, I hope that you would make that decision right now. You can stop listening to me, and, and you can say a prayer, and you can invite Jesus into your heart, and it will be the best decision and the best words you will ever hear is, is your Heavenly Father saying, well done, good and faithful servant. But I think there's also one other group of people that I want to address today, and that may be someone who's maybe already born again, and they're kind of at a different stage in their spiritual journey, and I'd describe it maybe as they're leaning away from godly wisdom. Because you too have seen some things, and you've experienced some things, and you've done some things, and, and maybe even it's easy to say that you've, well, I don't know, I've got this, right? Like, I can make these decisions all on my own. And you're kind of leaning away from godly, godly wisdom. I don't know, you're getting by on, on past success and things that always, always have worked for you. And today, I want to challenge you, as James challenges all of us, to lean back in and to go back to the source of wisdom in your life. In fact, it may help just to go back to what it meant the first time you received Jesus, the moment that you were saved, the time when you were literally born again. And, and you think about that, man, I, I was so reliant on God. I needed God for every decision. I prayed to him all the time. I couldn't get enough of his word. I, I couldn't stop sharing Jesus to all my friends and family. And this morning, you, you go back. You make a decision to go back and say, I want to go back to that source of godly wisdom. You must be born again. Last thought, second way for us to grow in godly wisdom is if we want godly wisdom, then walk with people who are walking with Jesus. I mean, this is kind of just the, the simple truth that who you surround yourself with will oftentimes define your life. And if you hang around knuckleheads, then don't be surprised if that's what your life looks like. You may need to set some boundaries. Now, it doesn't mean at all that we shouldn't be around and, and, and try to have an influence and a care for people around us. I mean, we're told to be in the world, but not of the world. But who is wise and understanding among you that you draw from? Who are the people that you walk with? I was thinking this week about how so many people, I mean, just, I've come to value this even more the older I get, uh, just how many people have poured into my life over the years. In fact, even to this day, I I've never shared this, but I got a pastor friend of mine across town who every Sunday, I mean every Sunday, I don't think he's ever sick, but every Sunday he texts me a little encouraging message. And it always seems to show up right before I step up on stage. If you notice me looking at my phone, it's, it's probably me looking for this text. And this friend of mine just always has these words of wisdom and mentoring to pour into me. And I've been doing this for 20 years, and I find I, I still need that. I still need a sense of 
of people helping people grow, people helping me grow. I'm grateful for so many people that have poured into my life. Life is better together in community with people who are walking with Jesus. I've got a great small group. I was actually just thinking about uh, this small group of mine and, and how they teach me so much about Jesus. We're studying just opening the Bible and reading First Peter and and I just was amazed at what these people know and understand and have lived out in their walk and how that encourages me, how we're built on this foundation, this cornerstone of Jesus Christ. Let me just ask you this morning, who are you walking with? This leads us into a time of worship. I'm going to invite the team to come up, Charles and the team to come up and to lead us. And I just want to ask you this morning, as you just have a few moments, to really work this out. How is God calling you to live with this heaven-down approach, to bring the kingdom of heaven down with the wisdom that God so desperately wants to pour into your life. If you would bow your head, and if you would pray with me, please. God, I'll just simply say we we love you, and we turn to you now, and we ask uh, that you would do what only you could do, which is to come down from heaven and come into the human heart, into our human hearts, that so desperately need us to have you make us new. And so, God, I would just pray for anyone within the sound of my voice who's never made that decision, that this morning is saying, I I want that too. I want to be born again. To just admit in our hearts that we've all sinned, we've all fallen short of the glory of God. But the confession, the calling of Jesus into our life is real and true and can change you. Just simply to say, Jesus, I give you my life. Make me new. And God, for others of us here today that just simply, we want to come back. We want to lean back into the wisdom. God, you promise you that you will pour out your grace and pour out your mercy and pour out your wisdom into our lives. God, I pray that we would be brave with your wisdom, that we would carry it into all the corners, into all the places, because those other spiritual forces are waging war against us, Lord. And so we need your wisdom, and we call upon you now as we give you back all of your worship and all of our prayers. It's in your name we pray. this time I'd like to invite everyone if you're able to stand with us as we continue singing our worship together. of Jesus over every heart and every mind cause I know there is peace within your presence I speak Jesus I just want to speak the name of Jesus Every dark addiction starts to break Declaring there is hope and there is freedom I speak Jesus Cause your name is power Your name is healing Your name
Jesus from the mountains and Jesus in the streets. Jesus in the darkness over every enemy. Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name, Jesus.
Bridgeway. Have a great Sunday and we'll see you next week.